Great, perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Saif. I'm the co-founder of AI Hello and the host of this webinar. I will be uh, speaking, you know, along with these gentlemen today about how to increase your profit on Amazon. Uh, we each have our own separate topic, so I'll introduce my topic first and have everyone tell us a bit about themselves, the company they work at, and the topic they're going to be speaking about today. So I'm going to be speaking about PPC software as a tool for growth. Uh, AI Hello, as you guys might know, is an Amazon PPC software company. We service around 5,000 sellers, and we're the 18th largest vendor on Amazon ads worldwide right now, and Amazon Advanced Partner, of course. I'll be showing you some examples of how we have been able to increase both sales and net profit. So I'm talking improved top line, bottom line, and actual margins after ads using PPC software. So I'll run you through some use cases for PPC tools. And then I'll also show you guys three real examples from real accounts that, have, uh, that we've worked with and how the actual metrics were influenced over time and how the software uh, was able to do most of the work to change those metrics. So that's my topic for today. Andrew, want to go next? Sure. Um, I'm Andrew Morgan. Um, I'm based out of Kansas City, but um, I'm representing Martinology. My company, my team is worldwide. So um, we're a worldwide team, not just here in Kansas City. Uh, today, I'm actually going to be talking about evaluating your metrics and doing it consistently, as I believe it's the key to really understanding um, where you can improve your business and where you can optimize, specifically when it comes to profitability. So whether it's a variety of different tools or it's very just even basic elementary Excel sheets, I think um, consistently tracking them is the key really to, to understanding um, what is happening in your business and then telling you where to focus. Perfect. Rael, want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Rael. I am co-founder at Nozzle. Um, today, I'm going to be speaking about how to use a particular metric known as customer lifetime value, or another way to say it is your profit per customer and how that grows over time uh, to, to grow your Amazon business, uh, whether you're after uh, new to brand growth or growing your profits. Uh, I'll show you to deep dive into the metrics and how to use them efficiently. Awesome. Jim? Thanks, Say. Uh, hi, guys. Um, my name is Jim Mann. I'm VP for Europe for Gatida. We do reimbursements for Amazon sellers. And I'm going to keep it really simple. I've got two things that you can action tomorrow that will drive your profits by anything from 3 to 12% um, increase, not decrease. So <laughs> stick, stay here and I'll share a couple of very simple tactics that will help you do that. Sounds great. Christian? Hey, everyone. I'm Christian. I'm the uh, co founder of Autopilot. Uh, we're going to dive into the organic optimization side, um, obviously high margins uh, for organic traffic and dive into a couple of hacks on how you can um, automate um, some of that, those improvements, but also even if you don't want to automate it, apply those tactics um, on your account on a regular basis and basically increase uh, the organic side, but also increase uh, your uh, advertising efficiency with that. So um, get both sides working um, together in, in balance. Perfect. So now we're going to proceed with the actual presentations. I will be going first, and then everyone's going to present in the same order. So let me just pop screen share open for you guys, and we'll get started. Here you just give me a moment over here. All right, just one moment, guys. I'm just going through this right now, and we'll be ready to go. It's right, probably worth saying that we'd encourage any questions as well. Um, yeah, of course. There's a Q and A uh, at the end. Yeah, please, guys. So sort of tell tell us where you are. Tell us what you think about these topics. Any questions around these topics? Very happy to. to I'm sure all of us are happy to talk and answer questions as we go. No one likes talking to a wall, so please give us some questions. Absolutely. All right, here we go. Can everyone see my screen, guys? Yeah. All right, let me just move this around just to clear up my view. Okay, present. All right, so as discussed, my software, um, sorry, my topic is PPC software as a tool for growth. Uh, we have been running this PPC tool for more than half a decade now. So it got started around 2018. 
so six years of automating people's ads. Uh, we've done a lot of manual management too. So I know like the differences between the two. I know the capabilities of both. And in this deck, I'm going to present the specific use cases that I found to be very useful with our PPC software over the last almost half a decade right now. And the uh, things that we've been able to pull off using our tool to grow the businesses that we work with. So first things first, why do people even use PPC software? There are four main reasons. The first one is human performance can be very inconsistent. And this could either be people on your team or the agency that you work with. So for example, if you guys have a team of your own, most of you probably would, uh, you know, like sometimes your PPC guy is off, he's sick. Uh, there's no, if you have, if you hire people offshore, there might not be Wi-Fi that day. There might not be electricity. You run into a bunch of different issues like that. And even outside of stuff like that, like sometimes you hire someone, they're not good. You hire another person, they're slightly better. They leave, they go get another job. You're forced to hire a third person. That person ends up being bad. So it becomes a headache. It becomes very difficult to get consistency with your PPC performance and to always be sure that everything like to do with the maintenance and growth of your account, like the harvesting, the negation, the uh, bidding, the placement boost, the day parting. It's very difficult to know that that stuff is happening at the high level every day if you don't have a tool in place. The second thing is if you're large, uh, managing a large number of products and campaigns, it's very difficult to do it manually. So if you have you know, several hundred SKUs, a thousand plus campaigns, like you could do bulk sheets theoretically, but you're still going to miss a lot of things because no one's going through bulk sheet row by row looking at every single keyword. And if you're doing that, you're wasting a lot of time, right? And if you're not using bulk sheets even and you're just doing it manually through campaign manager or even the targeting tab, again, huge amount of time you're wasting for worse results. Uh, the third thing is, is freeing up your time. So most owner operators up until like early seven figures are usually doing the PPC themselves if they haven't hired an agency. And these people end up telling me that they're spending 10, 15, 20 hours per week on their ads. And these people usually aren't the best at PPC. So they're using half of their work week, assuming they work a 40 hour week, they're using half of that time on their PPC. Now they're not even that good at it. So they end up wasting that time while they could have focused on other things that they're better at like product development, finding new suppliers, improving your margins, operations, fulfillment, and all that other stuff that could move the needle more for their business. Finally, number four is decreasing workforce requirements. If you have a large account, you might need several people working on your PPC. So if you're doing above 100K per month in ad spend on a larger product catalog, you could have like two, three, or four people working on your account. And if you're hiring uh, US space, that's a lot of money. Even if you're hiring offshore, like you're going to have to manage a bunch of people and it does add up uh, in terms of monthly expenses. So all of these are reasons people have started to implement PPC software over the last few years. After that, what can PPC software actually do for your account? So the first and main thing that you guys are all aware of is PPC software can adjust bids on all of your keywords every single day. So instead of you adjusting it occasionally or trusting some guy that you met online to do it for you, you could just have it done in a super accurate, super efficient way every single day for you without you having to touch those keywords, right? So you end up hitting your ACoS target. You don't miss a bit change. You don't miss a bit increase or a decrease. You don't miss anything. And it happens every day. You don't have to touch it or follow up on it. Second thing is it adds hundreds of keywords monthly to your campaigns. So as soon as you switch on the harvesting feature and our software and even other softwares, you're going to start to see a lot of keywords pop up in your different match types and your different ad types that ends up growing your account and growing your visibility. Third thing is it can negate bad search terms. So if you reach a certain spend threshold or a click threshold, depending on the software that you use, we can negate the search term for you automatically. And you end up saving thousands of dollars by doing this. I've seen accounts that are spending like forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year on keywords that should have been negated or search terms that should have been negated. Uh, the fourth thing is you can create up to 20,000 ad groups with all of the keywords and ASIN targets in place in one go. And this is literally like three or four clicks. And this is based on our own tool. This isn't, this isn't possible with most tools, but with us, you can do up to 20,000 ad groups in one go. And each ad group is going to show up with keywords and ASIN targets and even category targets in place. And this covers the, all the targeting types and all the match types that you could want. Uh, after that, you can decrease your ACoS and grow your sales. So we're going to show you a few examples of how we did that. You can adjust your placement boost automatically. So if you're performing differently, 
on each placement, which is usually the case. We can adjust your placement boost on each one every single day, which is generally something you wouldn't check manually. We could change it every single day for you to make sure your money is being directed towards the most profitable placements and not just being spent randomly because I do see some accounts where most of their budget is actually going to their worst placement. It's not something that they're looking to fix until we actually come in and put their uh, campaigns on our software. And then finally, we can do day parting. So I do have an example for this. Right, so is this all just a sales pitch? So obviously I am the co-founder of an Amazon PPC software company. I benefit from people using Amazon PPC, the PPC software, ideally mine. I make a lot of money doing this. So is this all just a sales pitch? To prove my point, I've gathered a few examples from real accounts. I'll show you the real numbers and the actual progress that we made. And you guys can be the judge of it. So over here, this is from my dashboard. Uh, you can see the before and after on this. So these are all 30 day periods. This is the first 30 days. And then you can see over here, this green dot, which means a bunch of the campaigns were connected on the software. And another green dot, which means some more campaigns were added to the software. And then you can see the difference in performance. So before this account was doing around $48,000 a month in spend and 115,000 in ad sales. It's these two figures over here. And they were at a 32.91% tackles, right? With 146,000 in total sales. A month later, they were able to cut $6,000 out of their ad spend and sell more. So they had 125K versus 115K in ad sales. They dropped their ACoS from 42% almost to around 34%. And their tackles dropped significantly. So for almost 33% to almost 27% with rounding, which is like a 6% uh, difference, which is huge. Talking about margins, 6% of revenue, no longer being spent on ads is huge for a margin, of course, especially when your sales went up by 10%. So 147K to 160K, 0.5 almost, right? So how did we do this? This account was initially targeting almost only 10 keywords, right? There were others in the campaigns, but they weren't really spending because of the bids. And since those 10 keywords were driving the majority of the traffic, they had to bid super high on those keywords. So they were paying an insane amount per click, which caused their ACoS to go up and obviously caused their tackles to go up. And after some time, like they reached a point where they were spending so much more on those keywords and they were driving an incremental revenue, right? So the tackles ended up being too high. Uh, what we did was we switched on harvesting and we harvested hundreds of keywords. And of those hundreds of keywords, we landed on 50 that ended up contributing significantly to the traffic and revenue of the account. And those helped increase sales, number one. And uh, number two, decreased our dependence on those first 10 keywords, which allowed us to reduce our cost per click, which also improved the ACoS and tackles, as you guys saw. So the second thing ties into what I said earlier. We stopped overbidding on those 10 initial keywords because we had replacements for them right now. We weren't dependent on those 10 keywords anymore. And then number three, we negated a lot of wasteful search terms. They had search terms in the account that had spent hundreds of dollars each without ever producing a sale and we negated those. And that dropped the ad spend by like a thousand plus per month, right? Our second example over here is actually a new launch. Um, this is some lifetime data for the product. So these campaigns were all set up through our software. All they did was they went into our campaign creator. They selected their product. They selected their budget and their ACoS target. They hit launch every single one of these campaigns showed up with all of the keywords, category targets, and ASIN targets already in place, fully researched for them. And obviously, obviously they showed up with auto campaigns too. And then the harvesting was already set up for them between those campaigns. So I just switched these on. The auto started spending. Some of the keywords started spending. The auto began harvesting into those other campaigns. And those campaigns were harvesting between each other. And eventually, the campaigns grew to the size that you see right now. So these fully automated campaigns uh, have spent 105 grand and made 320K for a new launch product at a 32.69% ACoS. And this is over the lifetime of the product. It isn't on month one or anything, but uh, almost a third of a million in sales, fully automated with them ever, without them ever having to put a keyword in, touch any bids, change any placement boosts, pause or unpause campaigns, change any budgets. It was all done for them, right? And this is lifetime. Like right now, this is doing a lot better. Like it's not like it's, only doing like 10 grand a month in ads when you guys are going to see the figures right now. So how did we achieve this? Uh, these campaigns were launched for a new product released in December of 23. So this is around uh, seven months ago. It was towards the end of December, so more like six months ago. 
uh, everything out the campaigns was automated, as I mentioned. So the setup, the keyword research, the harvesting, bidding, and negation, all of that was fully done through the tool. And these were never, ever touched by a human. Uh, and then those campaigns today are spending around 40K a month. And they're around a 27% ACoS, I believe. Uh, it's a bit lower than the ACoS I showed you in the previous screenshot, because that's the lifetime ACoS, which included the higher ACoS period once this product just launched. So they're doing pretty significant um, revenue out of this ASIN right now, probably above six figures a month if my math is right. And uh, this is all fully automated, right? So launch was the last thing that they did, everything from there to have a product that produces six figures monthly. Just from the ads, there's still the organic sales too. So probably a seven figure a year product, uh, even with the uh, down season for them, seven figures a year fully automated without them really having to do any work beyond sourcing the product and adding it to Amazon. Finally, uh, this is a day parting example. So this product is a, uh, sorry, sorry, this company sells a B2B product, uh, which is usually bought within work hours. So after work hours, it starts to become a bit dead, but not super dead. Then on weekends, it's completely dead. So if you guys look at the weekends over here, the ACoS is the pink line and the ad spend is the blue line. Uh, you can see that during the weekends, the ACoS kind of spikes up. So this is a weekend, this is a weekend, this is a weekend, and this is a weekend. Uh, and due to our day parting, we were able to turn those weekends into the lowest spend parts of the week. Some of it is because the search volume is lower on the weekend. And obviously you guys have already thought of that, but the spend was around 50% higher than what you see over here during the weekends. That was burning probably something like five to six K uh, per month above what's being spent right now uh, on the on the ads during the weekends. And we were able to decrease the bids automatically during the weekends and after work hours to conserve that ad spend and bring down tackles. The tackles for this account probably a year ago was around 15, 16%. Now it's below 10% and sales have actually gone up over time, not because of the day parting, but because of the other stuff that we've worked on. The day parting mostly influenced the ACoS and TACOS, not the total sales. All right, so this is the explainer for this. So this is what I mentioned earlier about selling B2B products and being able to save money on the weekends uh, by dropping the bids and the spend. That's pretty much it for my presentation. Uh, right now, I believe Andrew is up next. So I'm going to hand over to him and you guys can ask me any questions during the Q&A session at the end. Amazing. You're going to make them wait until the end to ask you questions. I wasn't sure. Um, I had some too, so I'll just have to save them. Um, sure. Amazing. Uh, I think some of those examples were fantastic as well. Just like I know not every scenario is just like that, but the ones that you can find that are just so drastic in regards to like weekends or a cost increases like that are just you know, in times right now, we're talking about profitability. Um, you know, that's what I'm talking about. And one of the keywords, like in my title, I put consistently, because I think that that's what's really, really important is, um, at least in my business as an agency, um, I have almost like a trend of like a, an up month, and then a down month, and then an up, down, up month. And so it's based on how people pay. And so it's really looking at a trend of three or four months, really to make good decisions in my business, not just one month, if I was just to look at one of those, those low months, um, I might quit, right? Uh, honestly, I might be like, this is it. I'm hanging in my time, losing too much money. But on the next month, it might be, you know, um, 10 times what that was. So it's consistently, consistently looking at them. And this is also something that's um, kind of dear to my heart right now, simply because um, for anyone that doesn't know, I've been in the Amazon space 13 years. Um, I'm a full, we're a full service agency, everything from content to PPC, international expansion, 1P to 3P, all those things. Um, but still we're talking about profitability and I'm building my own brands, um, and profitability matters. I'm running them very lean without investors, things like that. So in my own business this year, I met with, um, I have different owners, um, in some of these different private label brands that I'm growing and we really just had a coming, um, a coming together of saying, Hey, as owners, we want to be consistent about our data, consistent about our numbers. We can get kind of just lazy counting on the team as an agency or whatever that is. But I put my owner hat on and I'm like, what really matters to, to me as a business owner? What's going to help drive us forward? Let's do the things that we know to do. And that's to track our data um, very, very consistently. And, and there's a lot of software that can help you do this. But sometimes I think even um, doing it just the old fashioned way in Excel can prove to be very valuable and help you just remember kind of some of the basics. I think if you've been doing this a long time, 
you can get kind of like, well, I know my numbers, I've checked them, I, I know my manufacturing costs, whatever. Well, when was the last time you made no assumptions, you went back to the basics and started with your data and really started tracking it? So I don't have a slideshow presentation. I really have two screens um, pulled up, almost like live worksheets that I'm using today in my business. I want to show you guys like just kind of the real stuff. Um, of what I'm doing. Um, maybe you can compare your notes to what you're doing. Maybe you can say, Hey, Drew, I would love to see your spreadsheet and kind of how you came up with that, what you're doing. Everyone has their own way um, of kind of tracking these things. Safe, can you help me? Um, what am I looking for to take over the screen here? Yeah. So you should have a share screen button. It should got be it. like white green. I got it. Okay. Yeah. So can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, we okay. can. It's it's a bit small, but just again, for anyone that doesn't know this, you can just, you can zoom in as if you're on your, on a trackpad, you can zoom in as if you're on an iPhone. So is that, oh, is that better? Yeah. Wait, do, you're doing it, you're doing it for everyone. It's just in case anyone, if you weren't going to do that. There you go. Okay. So um, this is actually a tool called KPOC. They're a partner of ours. I know there's a million great tools out there for profitability and all types of things. But for me, KPOC is a, is a all encompassing tool. Um, it helps my account managers, an account manager for anyone in the agency that's, that isn't using an agency or doesn't know that an account manager ultimately acts just as if you are a, a self-owned business running it yourself. That account manager is thinking about all things for that account, kind of putting on that owner hat and helping drive the ship. So um, whether you're an entrepreneur doing it yourself, you're a, a small team doing it yourself, you're an agency with an account, you know, an account manager at an agency or even a junior VA trying to learn. I think this can be helpful for everyone. Um, what we're looking at is a profit and loss statement of uh, a, a brand selling on Amazon. Think of them like a private label brand. And we're tracking consistently. This is not an Excel spreadsheet. This is obviously a lot easier. What we have to enter here is cost of goods. And then it pulls in through the API um, returns, promotions, discounts, storage, um, inventory placement fees, those types of things. It's it's taken into account PPC, all of those things to really help you get an accurate view because we just talked PPC and PPC is super, super important. Getting your tacos is super, super important. But if you look at this profit and loss spreadsheet right here, um, you're going to actually see that PPC is actually toward the bottom of this profit and loss spreadsheet. There's a whole lot of things that happen to your margin before you even get to advertising. So it's not, it's, it's very, very important, but it really is the lower end It's what's left over. Now you get to PPC, what can you really do? And so looking at this brand, this is not looking at it at a skew basis. So I recommend looking at your numbers in, in a number of different ways. What we're looking at right here is a brand wide look at this, at this company. So I'm able to look like for me, what's really helpful is trends. Any number by itself could, can be amazing or horrible. You don't really know unless you're comparing it to something else. And it's not about comparing it to um, the business that has like really slow weekends or comparing it to a, a food brand or your buddy's brand or your, your sister's brand or whatever the case might be. Um, it's honestly looking at your data compared to your data. Are you improving on, on your stats? Who cares what the guy next door or the girl next door is doing? Um, or you hear about this business, you read about it, like, is your business improving or not? Are you profitable or not? So I've got average selling price. Um, we see that refunds come out. We see that promotional rebates come out. And all these things can tell me to, to make a different action. If all of a sudden I see my, my promotional rebates um, as an average or my refunds um, or my returns as an average is changing drastically, that's going to inform me, hey, I'm having a, a return problem. Hey, I've actually started discounting my products too much and it's taking too much of my margin. By the time I take out my refunds uh, or my returns, Gatita is going to get in here, Jim, here in a second and talk to us about how you can get some of those monies back and stuff. That's actually lower here in the profit in the profit sheet. Um, but this is where you're getting returns, uh, promotional rebates. And if, if this margin starts shrinking too much, if I'm sub 90 when normally I'm above 90, that's that's a message to me based on my trend that I've been tracking consistently. Hey, I need to make a change. So moving quickly, you know, not every numbers look the same. Not everyone's cost of goods is is um, you know 15% of net sales. Not everyone's selling fees are 15% or 18%. Inventory fees can vary. I know everyone's going through changes this year. It could be heavy coming out of January and change. So all these things change. 
this is kind of one of those inventory um, reimbursements. So this is a, a positive number coming in here from something like Gatita can help you with who's on this call. I'm going to explain some of that. So these numbers can change and that has to do with how well your inventory went in or mistakes Amazon's making or things like that. But I'm also looking at this margin. Okay. So you can see like um, over the last four months, like we had a drop here, that would have been a, a red alert to me. What's going on here? Why, why was my margin so, so low um, coming into that? And then we get to PPC advertising. And right now in this account, every account has different goals. Everything has different strategies. Um, right now we are pushing, pushing, pushing. This is a seasonal brand, spring, summer, fall type of uh, product. It's actually a yard product like for, for the lawn. So we're making a big push. We're also launching um, six new like parent SKUs. So in SKUs underneath them this season that had never been launched before. So some of these different reasons for PPC costs being higher on the taco side because of these things that we're doing. We're not in a lean mode. We're actually like really pushing into a growth mode. So, you know, this is a number, we have goals of where we're trying to get. We're actually trying to get closer to like 35, 40% margin, but we're in a push right now. And so we have a bottom of 20 and a, and a high of 35 that we're shooting for. So everyone's like, well, what are these numbers? What numbers should I be? What is, what is common? What is standard? And I think that what I'm trying to say is that that depends on your own business, your own goals, what you need to do, you know, what your overhead is, all those types of things. But this is really at, um, the, the account level and the next level below that would be, um, the SKU level. And I'm going to do that just very quickly. And then I'm going to move to my other spreadsheet. Cause I, I really want to make sure I stay on time and I can get long winded, but you know, like I said, I'm going to say it again, consistently software can help you stay consistent, but just because you have a software, you can get a little lazy and, and expect it to do everything for you. And there's another level of profitability um that might happen at the warehouse before it even gets into your cost of goods or it could happen um you know post purchase it could happen any number of ways there's certain areas that touch your business that you got to make sure um you're keeping track of so on this one i wanted to look at the skew the skew basis and it's working for me thank goodness um and i'm not going to show you all of these details but what you can see is that on a skew by skew basis we actually have different ad spend, different COGS, different return rates, different conversion rates, um, different profitability um, at the end of the day, different margins. Um, and you can see that for some of them, um, they might be in the red. And those might be the ones that we need to focus on this month or this quarter um, versus the ones that are in the black. And so while the whole account as a whole might be hitting the goals that we want, there might be individual products that still need our focus. And the reason why I'm saying tracking data and these things consistently are so important is because there's always room for improvement in your business. There is always room for improvement in your business. Sometimes looking at it at a top level um, is good to get you through. You know, you're super busy. You need to just look at top line numbers and move on. But when you can slow down in your business, reset, don't make any assumptions, um, and evaluate where you are. And while you're doing good, you can always be doing better, just like those four SKUs in the red I showed you this month that I know, hey, maybe there's too much PPC spend. Maybe the price needs to be raised. Maybe we had too many promotional discounts. Maybe inventory fees are high. Any number of things that could have led to that. And this last view, um, can you guys see my Excel sheet? I, I switched screens on, on my computer. Yep, everything's yeah. fine. Okay. okay. So this is kind of that next level that I was talking about in regards to, cool, you have software, you're in, it's, it's everything that's happening on Amazon from your refunds to your storage, et cetera. Um, but this is actually what happens before it gets to your cost of goods. And so in each of my businesses, um, you know, I've built this, I've built this spreadsheet in this particular example to show, um, you know, we're on Chewy, we're on Amazon, we're on Walmart, we're on Amazon Canada, we're on a lot of different marketplaces with this product, and all of them have different fees, different costs, different inbound, um, one's a wholesale relationship, one's direct to consumer, so it really, it can behoove you to go back in with my team, at least that's what I've been doing this year with my personal brands and making no assumptions. Maybe I've acquired the brand. Maybe we just haven't gone to our manufacturers recently. Any number of these reasons we need to track our numbers. And so we're going back in here and saying, hey, is my pricing right for, for my, my bottle costs? Is my pricing right for my labels? Is my pricing right for my 
for my product costs and my supply chain? Have any fees changed in that regard? Has the the 3PL I'm using or the warehouse gone up? Do I need to factor that into my, my unit economics? It, are my PPC costs the same as they were last year on average? Am I looking at that? Um, what's my customer lifetime value? What's my customer retention rate? Um, what's my average order value? And looking at these things, not just as a brand as a whole, but then going down um, skew on a skew by skew basis. So I, I know I covered a lot, but I really just wanted to hopefully perk someone's um, thinking around, you know, maybe, hey, there, you know, maybe it's I, I'm uh, challenging you a little bit to say, hey, I haven't done that in a really long time and I need to go back into my business. But sometimes when you're not getting growth, um, you know, you're looking for growth this year and you're not finding it. You're looking like 2023 was hard for a lot of people. You're looking for growth. You can't find it. One of the best ways um, to redirect that kind of that energy of like of of less of of scarcity of the sales aren't coming is to say, hey, what can I do? What can I control? And what you can control is to get back into your business and just know it top to bottom um, and you'll feel better. It's like going to the gym and tracking your workouts versus just going to the gym and winging it. Like if you're going to the gym, you're tracking your workouts, you're right now what you did yesterday. You come back in, or you're writing down what you did last week. You come back in, you compare notes, and you're like, wow, um, it's been three or four weeks since I started doing this. But look, I can already see that I've gone up a couple of weights in these different workouts and things like that. Um, I'm biking five miles longer or whatever the case might be. Um, and you'll see that if you're tracking it, um, you're bound to see improvement. And I would love if anyone uh, takes this to heart and actually starts doing this in their business. And in a month or two, they're really seeing some results. I, I would love to hear from you guys. And that's it for me today. Perfect. No, this was amazing. I think this could work as a uh, wake up call for some of the sellers who are going to watch this because most of the people that I work with aren't checking their numbers at home. Like a lot of people don't know what they're spending on ads. Even many people don't know their margins, their fulfillment costs, their landed cost. So I think this could be a wake up call uh, for some sellers, ho uh, hopefully watching this. And uh, yeah, no, I think this was super useful. They always say like, if you're not on top of your numbers, your numbers are definitely on top of you. A lot of people are losing money or not making as much as they think they are. They only find out at the end of the year. So you have to really be updating the stuff monthly at the very least. And you have to know your numbers by heart. So this was super useful. Thank you so much. Right. Perfect. Uh, Rael, you're up next. Good. Well, thank you, everyone. Drew, I loved um, I love various aspects of that. But I think uh, the focus on profitability uh, is certainly one of them. And the other one was uh, your mention of lifetime value, because that is pretty much uh, what I'm going to be talking about here for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. So um, I guess what, I, what I'm going to be talking about is quite a specific uh, strategy to grow profits on Amazon. It's not applicable uh, to every single seller. Um, but you know, hopefully it's applicable to to enough people here or to pique your interest when you are thinking about what to sell on Amazon even um, and then have, help sort of guide your choice. So I'm talking about this idea um, of customer lifetime value on Amazon and specifically about a, a strategy about not breaking even on the first order. So how is it that not breaking even on the first order can boost your profits in the long term, right? Like that's pretty much... Uh, the key question here, and that's what I'm going to be going through um, on on in the next ten minutes. So, um, definitely, just needs a bit of an introduction about what we are talking about when we we talk about this idea of lifetime value and sort of the other side of the coin, what we call customer acquisition cost. So, a little scenario uh, to bring this to life, which is firstly a definition of customer lifetime value, which is the net profit from any given customer of yours over the entire period that they're buying from you, that you have a relationship with them. So let's take a basic scenario. In January 24, a new to brand customer comes in via an ad. Via an ad. They make their first, uh, place their first order. And the profit you get from this is $5. And profit is pretty much what Drew was just showing there on the unit economics, right? Which is you want to take the price minus any discounts, your cost of goods sold, all the various Amazon fees, uh, and a bunch of other things as well. But you really want to focus on this idea of profit, not sales. Um, and we'll get to why very shortly. So they come in and make place the first order. You you, you make $5. Uh, three months later in April, they come back and buy again. It does not have to be the same product. It could be something else. But let's assume it is the same product. So that's another $5. And they do this two more times, all the way through to September. So we would say that the 
lifetime value after nine months is $20, i.e. the profit that you've made from this customer um, is $20. And that's what we talk about, about lifetime value. Now, the acquisition cost is how much you're paying to acquire a new to brand customer. And again, lots of ways to calculate this. A, a nice sort of neat simplified way is to add up all the ad spend and divide by the number of new to brand customers you have in any given month. So let's sponsor products, sponsor brands, sponsor display, DSP if you're using that. Add up all the ad spend and divide by the number of new to brand customers will give you a sense of how much you're paying to acquire a new to brand customer. So how do you bring these two concepts together is a very fundamental rule, which is to say, if the lifetime value, if the profit per customer is greater than what you're paying to acquire that customer in the first place, well, then you're golden, right? But if it's the other way around, if the, if the customer after 12 months is only worth $10, but you've paid $20 to acquire that customer, well, then you're in pretty bad shape, right? You're not going to last very long. And so that's kind of the fundamental business equation. And, you know, something like this is very much predicated, of course, on customers coming back and buying again. So this is not applicable, you know, to products that if you're selling televisions or furniture or things like that, which pretty much lend themselves to one-off orders, or you're going to be waiting five, 10 years for the next order, that's not really applicable. But if you are in categories or niches that deal with health and beauty products, food and drinks, um, pet products, supplements, household cleaning, baby products, any of those sorts of, of categories where naturally there are going to be repeat orders, this is definitely something worth pursuing and tracking what that customer does uh, after that first order. Because really the Amazon um, universe is, and, and the, historically the data you get from Amazon is all focused on, on very much that first order only, right? And most of the magic happens after that first order. So it answers a fundamental question. If you know how profitable a customer is after three months, after six months, after 12 months, and how that whole uh, that whole journey grows, then it answers a real fundamental question, which is how much you can spend to acquire a new customer, right? Um, and what we call something like a true break-even ACOS or lifetime ACOS, uh, it goes by different different uh, words here. But really the, the whole drawback of ACOS if you're measuring that in, in an advertising sense, is it's pretty much focused on the profitability, but only on that first sale, right? Only on that first order. But we've just said that, you know, if you've got businesses in one of these categories, most of the sales and most of the profit you're getting from that customer is after that first order. And so ACOS just does not capture uh, anything that happens after the first order. So we would say it's almost misleading in a way if you're in one of these categories and have high subscribe and saves or repeat orders. Right, and so here's just, a, again, a very basic example where on the left-hand side where my cursor is, you can see I spend $10, the ad sales 20, uh, and therefore an ACOS of 50, which is not so great. But what happens if that individual places three more orders, right, of 20? So all of a sudden it's $80 and not $20. And if you do the same ACOS calculation, it's now 12.5%, not 50%. A completely different picture. And you're making fundamentally different decisions uh, of a 12.5% ACoS than from a 50% ACoS, right? Um, and so, again, I, I, you know, only got 10 minutes here. It's quite a deep topic, but I just want to go through a very practical example of how we would typically use this ad nozzle um, to do this. I mean, there's definitely going to be a, just maybe preempting one question: um, How do you get the data to even do the calculations and all these sort of things? A fulfillment report will get you most of the way. Uh, you might not have the most accurate uh, you know, granular data sets there, but you can get a very long way by analyzing the individual orders via fulfillment report there. But let's talk about a uh, specific example. So, um, you know, you can do this on a brand level and it's really helpful to do that. But again, as Drew mentioned earlier, drilling down into like individual uh, SKUs and ASINs, I think is really where you're going to squeeze out the most profitability. So the question then is, how is it that you would... Um, know which ASINs to focus on, right? And so step one for us would be, okay, let's find the ASINs that have a decent amount of sales every month that are coming from repeat customers, right? And we've set a benchmark uh, based on experience of about, let's say at least 40% of your sales need to be coming from existing customers uh, as a good place to start. And of course you wanna do things like 
remove any outliers around, yeah, it might be 40%, but it's only been launched for six months and we're not quite sure. So do it like on, you know, stable ASINs that have uh, good fundamentals, good ratings, reviews, and you're not going to have any inventory issues and things like that, right? So you want to make sure that uh, you're going to make an investment in this, uh, that it's going to be around for a while. So step one, at least 40% coming from uh, existing customers, 40% of sales, ensure the fundamentals are good. Then step three um, is kind of the key one here, right? Is you want to understand where the biggest gap is between the profit per customer over time versus what you're paying to acquire that customer. So if, for instance, um, after three months for Ace and A, a customer's worth $30, right? And I'm only paying $10 to acquire, that difference is $20. But let's say for Ace and B, after three months, they're only worth $20. And I'm still paying $10 to acquire them. That means I'm only making that difference is only $10. So you've got a $20 difference versus how valuable somebody is uh, versus what you're paying to acquire them versus a $10 difference in that. So, so you want to start with the ASINs that have the largest gap, right? The largest gap between how much they're worth over time versus how much you're paying to acquire them. So that's how we would prioritize which ASINs to, um, you know, to, to invest more in. Um, step four is the kind of payback period, right? You want to prioritize ASINs with the shortest, what we would call replenishment cycle. How often are people buying? You can use this strategy, uh, but if someone only is expected to buy once a year because they're buying these giant multi-packs or something like that, you're pretty much going to have to wait a year uh, to see the results. And that's not great versus something where let's say I'm selling supplements. It's a 30 or 60 day supply of supplements. And so, you know, people are buying every 30 or 60 days. Um, so you want to prioritize ASINs uh, that have a short replenishment or repurchase uh, cycle. And once you've identified those, it might even only be sort of two to three ASINs, those are the prime candidates that you want to invest uh, a lot more in, right? Uh, so just to um, you know, recap that you prioritize those with the largest gap. And then what do you do? Once you've done that, um, you, you can say that, okay, instead of breaking even on the first order for these two to three ASINs, I'm happy to break even on the second order, right? And, it, and what that means is instead of paying $10 to acquire a customer, it might mean I can now afford $15 to acquire a customer or $20 to acquire a customer. And that fundamentally, again, will change your PPC strategy. It means you can go after higher cost per click terms. Um, you can invest in higher up the funnel strategies. So awareness campaigns, DSP, video, all those sorts of things. Um, and the chances are your competitors are not doing this sort of analysis. So if you're the only one out of your uh, competitive set that's actually saying, I've got the numbers to back up breaking even on the second order, which might take three months, um, that means I can be pretty aggressive, right? Around my, my customer acquisition strategy, knowing that my payback period is, let's say three months uh, and in the second order. So I think for some brands that are perhaps used to selling in, in the D2C world, this idea of not breaking even on that first order is probably quite a well-known idea. But I think in the Amazon uh, universe, especially if you're in one of these categories, it's not a well-known idea. And, and we've had loads and loads of, 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 I guess, nozzle customers over the last, what, three years or so in these categories use this playbook to grow uh, market share and to grow profits over time. They keep on acquiring profitable customers backed by this, this sort of analysis um, and these numbers. So um, that's it from me. I'm sure there are uh, follow-up questions. I look forward to answering them a little bit later. Thank you. Perfect. That was super useful. We actually work with a lot of sellers in the uh, replenishable categories and a lot of them launch on Amazon. Yeah. They have no clue that their ACOS is going to be like 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. <laughs> if they've just launched, it's going to be like 100% plus, 150% plus. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good that you spent a significant portion of this presentation talking about the right ASINs to advertise because when you're in uh, exactly. replenishables, you obviously live and die by the customer lifetime value. And the is, you know, if you just launch like a vitamin C supplement and you have zero reviews and, you know, it's just another yeah. supplement, yeah. like, sometimes the uh, lifetime value on that and the Absolutely. Way people come back just isn't going to be good. That's yeah. why most new supplements are never term profitable. I agree. Uh, and, 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 and I would argue, well, they don't have the data behind them. Like we, we've had, like just very quickly, I guess, we've had customers that um, 
invest a lot in new to brand acquisition. So their goal is to grow. They think that the best way of growing the business is via new to brand acquisition. And, and supplements is very expensive, right? CPCs are extremely expensive. And so they're paying, you know, $40, $50 to acquire a customer with, I don't know, very, very large CPCs. But actually, if you look at the data, their retention rates are not good, right? Exactly. And, so, and so the problem there is, you know, you need a fixed retention before you even think about trying to fill up a leaky bucket basically all the exactly. time, right? You've, exactly. you've focused on the wrong side of the equation, fixed retention, why are not enough people coming back? Once you fix that, sure, then go, you know, on a big new to brand acquisition drive via PPC, et cetera. Anyway, um, I'll keep quiet, but like any questions on this, uh, I can chat about it all day, so yeah. <laughs> Perfect, yeah, we're gonna have a Q&A session at the end. All right, let me just check who's up next. I think it's probably Jim. Just give me a moment, just gonna check our timeline here. Right. Uh, yes, Jim, it's you. You're up next. Okay, good. Thanks, guys. That was very interesting. I'm pleased to say I think we're quite aligned on our messaging. So uh, we'll let you guys decide at the end of this with the questions. So I'm just going to share screens quickly. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, look, I'm going to uh, also dial in a little bit on profitability, which Let's be honest, selling on Amazon is kind of easy. Making money on Amazon these days is pretty tough, right? So, um, you know, my background, by the way, is I sold on Amazon from 2013, I had a multi seven figure business. And then I was head of MA at Thrasio. So, um, Thrasio is, is an interesting story, but it, what it allowed me to see was hundreds of profit and loss accounts from pretty successful FBA brands. And a lot of the stuff we're talking about today is absolutely relevant to that. And unit economics is a huge part of whether you have a business that's worth anything or not going forward. So everything that Drew was talking about around unit economics, 100%. Everything about lifetime value that Ray was just talking about, yes. And I'm going to talk about some stuff now, which hopefully brings all this in line as well. So, um, you know, 2024, Amazon's getting tougher. Advertising costs are potentially going up. It's hard to keep them down. Amazon fees with new inventory placement, Low inventory fees, high inventory fees, seasonal fees. It's getting tough. Amazon's taking bites of the cherry all the time. Shipping costs are stabilized at the moment, but you know, historically just went up a bit. Um, and of course, competition, because there is so much traffic, or at least so many customers on Amazon, of course, by default, that drives a lot of competition. So um, what does that mean? Are margins up for most people? Probably not, right? At the moment... I think people are trying to optimize their business rather than scale their business. And a big part of optimization equals focusing on margin, which is why we're all here today. So what drives profit? I'm going to fly through this because each one of these um, could be a, a topic in themselves. But, you know, Rael kind of just touched on this, that you can advertise the hell out of a product. But if you haven't got a truly differentiated product, don't spend money on it. And it kills a lot of people. So Focus on the basics, right? Common sense, like Drew was saying, common sense and versus common practice. Make sure your products uh, uh, organically have a right to be on page one or you're just going to blow money trying to force them up there, which is not sustainable. You get a business pretty quick. So have a differentiation in your product or your brand, right? Fire an audience, maybe externally. Cogs and packaging. Um, you know, cost of goods a lot of people focus on. Actually, one of the biggest costs on Amazon are the FBA fees related to size tiers. So have a look at how you can optimize the size of your packaging to bring your unit costs down. You'd be amazed how many retail-ready products could be redesigned to optimize themselves for Amazon FBA fees. And if you're a real Amazon like native uh, seller, you should really be looking at redesigning packaging to bring your, your size tier, your, your FBA fees down in terms of size tiers. That's where often you'll find your biggest impact and profit. Not everyone does this. I think everyone knows this. Not everyone does it. Price. Test your price. You know, which everyone, you're testing all day long with PPC. The biggest and immediate impact you can have on, on profit is testing price. There are tools out there. I recommend you use them. But please test price. Again, very few sellers. When I speak at events, you ask 100, 7, 8 bigger sellers who's tested price in the last six months. 5% of the room put their hand up. Everyone's petrified of doing it. It's common sense, not common practice. Um, I'm just moving stuff around on my screen so I can see what's here. So images and copy, again, we're coming back to, you've got to have a great listing. If you spend money driving traffic into your listing 
and it doesn't convert, you're wasting money. So make sure your listing is absolutely optimized before you start putting money into sending traffic there. Great product, great listing, conversion equals profit. Um, PPC I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a minute. That's what I'm going to focus in on. Um, and the final bit is the external traffic, which is a whole topic in itself. So um, two specific things. We've got 10 minutes. We'll probably use about three. So I'm going to talk about two things that I think you can take away and do tomorrow that will drive profit in 2024. So day parting. Um, so if you kind of touched on this earlier, um, the reason I put this picture up here, by the way, is because I was, I was in South Africa at an event last year and we saw this lion sat there and it was super chilled out and happy. And, we're, you know, I was thinking, what, you know, this guy's the king of the jungle. And if you think about how lions hunt, they don't move until they have to. They're not running around all day, scampering around, trying to find little rats. They know when to hunt. They get up and they go and get their, their, their food when they need it. And day parting is a little bit like that. It's not shooting or hunting at targets when you don't need them. And here's some data that visualizes this. Can everyone see this okay? Yep. And what, what you can see here, and this, this is data for e-commerce, right? This data will change if you're uh, looking at products or categories that require people to be purchasing, looking at television, which obviously is a much more evening-based session. Now, you can see here, at 9 o'clock in the morning, this is the time when people are most likely to be buying. And throughout the day, you can see at around 8, 8.30 in the evening, that drops off. So what does that mean to us? If you're advertising outside of those hours, you are most probably dealing with browsers, not buyers. They're burning through your clicks. It's as simple as that. Now, some people go, well, I advertise in the evening because it's cheaper. You go, okay, but is that really driving sales? So do your research, look at your uh, transaction reports. This is real data. And for most, I would say eight out of 10 people, Try and turn off your advertising outside of those hours. And watch how you behave. When you're sat at home in the evening, switched off, watching TV, you're browsing, you're clicking on ads. You're not really there with any intent to buy. It's a low intent time of day. So after 8.30, be very careful about burning money on clicks. And you know, I, I know that you guys on the call here got some views on that. We can talk about it shortly. And the second bit of this, look at how people are buying on date in terms of days of the week. Now, my experience, again, every brand is different, every category is slightly different, but what you'll see on most Amazon sellers is actually Sunday night and Monday morning are big sales times. And this data supports that if you look at this. So Monday, highest time. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, pretty good. Friday, Friday evening, do not start spending money on adverts. Saturday, everyone's out with their family, they're playing sport, they are not buying stuff. And Sunday, it starts to peak again. So what does this mean? Spend money on Sunday night and Monday morning. Those are your biggest sales days of the week. Stop losing clicks on Saturdays and after 8.30 in the evening and before 10, 10 o'clock in the morning. Of course, the biggest time, why is Monday morning huge? Everyone comes back from the weekend, slightly depressed on a Monday morning. They get through their inbox and at 10 o'clock, they're trying to distract themselves with what they can <laughs> they can buy to make themselves feel better. So um, this is day parting. You will probably... You can do this manually. Amazon are bringing out some beta testing on this in Seller Central, but you'll need to work probably with an agency or piece of software to help you do this. Anecdotally, by the way, um, and this is a true story from a friend, you know, everyone at the moment is complaining about how they're bleeding money on PPC. This friend uh, was an, a $9 million seller. They bought their PPC, their TACOS down. They reduced their TACOS by 7%. That's 7% on the bottom line. You won't find that through any other activity. So please go and look at how you can use day parting to drive more profit into your business tomorrow. Okay, the second bit is around reimbursements. Now, obviously, Katida, this is what we do. We're the, we like to think we're the best in the world at this. It's all we do. If we don't do this best, we'll probably get out of business. So we're very focused on one thing, which is working with Amazon FBA sellers to get 1% to 3% of revenue back via reimbursements. Now, 1% to 3% is quite exciting. But what's important here is what you can do with cash flow. So any business owner here or account manager, your job is to leverage every dollar in your business. And every dollar should have a multiplier on it, whether you buy product, whether you put it in PPC, whether you hire people. Let me show you how this works. So 
Katina, we'll get you one to four percent sometimes of annual revenue back through reinvestments. You put that into PPC. PPC guys on the call will know that a three X ROAS return on ad spend is a conservative expectation. If your team are not getting a three X ROAS, you should probably question their performance or the campaigns they're running. Right? So let's be conservative. So three X ROAS on one to four percent of revenue. What do you get? Three to twelve percent top line sales growth with the same cash flow that's already in the business. I don't think you'll find another way of driving 10% growth in your business without hiring more people or putting more money into your business. And that's what can reimbursements can do. That's what Gatita can do working with you. So it's a shameless pitch, but it's a legitimate pitch. You should be doing reimbursements, whether you do it yourself or with your partner. I hope you choose Gatita. And to make this real, this is um, this is from a, a $6 million seller. So just over 1% of the annual revenue, we got them back. Now, you know, again, like I was saying before, always be thinking about how to multiply the money you have in your business. So we talked about PPC. If you're thinking about using an agency, the reimbursement cash flow can pay for your agency fees. If you're looking to hire someone, what would you do with $68,000 as a $6 million seller? You could hire really good talent with this cash flow. A lot of business owners and entrepreneurs are scared of investing in people because a salary seems a lot of money. This can release money to hire new talent. And the same with inventory, you know, and it, FBA businesses and inventory-based businesses, they're cash flow-based business. Everyone is always struggling for cash flow and, and, and cash flow cycles. This kind of $68,000 for a $6 million seller can buy a lot of inventory, could launch a new product with it, for example. So reimbursements is a pretty dull topic, but it's quite exciting when you think about the impact it can have on your business. Um, for anyone that's not already using Gatida, feel free to scan this. You can log, uh, register your account here. We'll get you $400 for free, zero fees. You can cancel your account after that. You don't, we don't lock you in. So there's an opportunity there to try to get to the services if you want to. And just to wrap up, two takeaways from this little session. Please look at how you can use day parting. It's a big, big profit driver. It's a big way to uh, reduce your tack odds. And look at how reimbursement cash flow it's not just about the reimbursement cash flow, it's what you can do with it that really drives the impact on the business. That's it from me, guys. I'm happy to answer any questions or we can talk about it later. Awesome. And if anyone wants my contact details, by the way, that's my LinkedIn. You can scan that QR and hit me up on LinkedIn. Great. Thanks, Perfect. Guys. Thank you so much for that. No, this is super actionable. Uh, day parting, especially for a certain categories, where you do see a huge difference between hours of the day and day, like coffee, for example, sells better at certain hours, B2B stuff, again, certain hours, it sells a lot better. So if you're in a category like that and you're not day parting, like guaranteed, there's at least an extra 5.0% tackle. So you could probably cut out if you were to cut the ad spend during the low performance days and hours. So I think that's super useful and reimbursements, obviously, I won't call it free money, but it's almost that, like you could take that money again, like Jim said, like hire an agency, get some inventory, launch a new product. Because a lot of people think that the, I guess, barrier to more growth or barrier to more products or higher quality people is cash and that they don't have it in their business. But obviously, if you're not doing reimbursements, you could probably start right now, get some of the cash and fund some of those operations and continue to grow your business to more products, more ad spend or extra help from an employee or an agency. So super useful stuff. Thank you for sharing that. No worries. My pleasure. Perfect. Chris, you're up next. Sorry, just had to find the unmute button here. Uh, thank you, Saibs. I'm super uh, excited to uh, uh, join this webinar. Um, now we're going to look at, I guess, a version of free money, uh, essentially, which is uh, generating more organic lift, uh, which can you can either apply the, the tactics that we're going to talk about, like on your business directly um, or leverage a solution like ours to generate that um, lift uh, automatically. But what we're gonna go into is basically an approach to listing optimization, hacks around that, and how Amazon uh, evolves around listing optimization around AI search uh, these days. Um, before we jump in quickly on my background, I'm Christian, one of the co-founders of Autopilot. Um, it's been yeah, almost nine years since I started working with, with Amazon data. Initially, we were uh, heads down with our team or on the machine learning side for a couple of years, but then really came into uh, the e-commerce space in late 2020, 
Um, we started using our tools to build transparency for brands, grew up to 12,000 brands that are actively connected today and um, went through a process of launching real-time alerting. Uh, we we're very passionate about the, the topic of alerting folks on things that will help them drive their profits. But we also realized that um, it's very easy to drive cognitive overload and just, and it's a little bit like sitting in the cockpit where everything's blinking left and right, um, where, where you know, more alerts are not always helpful. And that's really where like our shift over the last one and a half years to, to autopilot came from. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about kind of the, the learnings from that journey, which um, are applicable to everyday um, listing optimization. Um, so really the, the goal is two things. Um, first of all, increasing organic traffic and as a benefit of that also increasing over, overall return on ads ad sales and uh, ad spend, um, both obviously in the absolute and of increasing your, your sales as a relative share against paid, uh, paid sales. Um, the, the reason why we're so passionate about this from a net profit perspective is obvious. Um, organic traffic carries the, the higher margin. Uh, so we wanna make sure that you have kind of a healthy mix of that in your listing. Now we focus on a variety of things around the product catalog. So let's start with uh, some of the basics around that. And you know, just, I guess, reflecting on, on that question, like when was the last time that you actually optimized your listing content? And you know, how did that, like, when was that for, for your top ASINs? Um, last week, last month, last quarter, probably one of those. But then, you know, what about the full catalog? Like when was the last time you really ranked up that full catalog? Most folks um, have never get to the, the majority of ASINs that they um, set up at some point to, to optimize. And the reason for that is, is simple, which is um, it's, a, it's a common understanding that um, at least for, for many setters, 20% of the ASINs are driving 80% of the sales. So frankly speaking, it's not necessarily worth your time really going um, you know, into that long tail and, and optimizing that. But the inverse is also true, which is that the 80%, which you don't spend time on optimizing, they will never make it into um, kind of that uh, top percentile here. Um, and they, they would never reach that point unless they, they get optimized. So when we talk about listing optimization, it's basically, you could say, how do we, the question of how do we reduce the transaction costs and making sure that everything gets optimized, the entire long tail gets the lift, and you can essentially move the entire revenue and profit profile um, of your brand up. And by the way, uh, this also generates uh, a perfect playground for the advertising side, because any advertising dollar that here would probably be spent on the yellow part. Um, assuming it's lower listing quality, it's basically cash thrown out of the window um, because you will know that you have lower conversion rates on maybe more poor listings. Uh, so by bringing the quality up that opens you know, a playground for AI Hello here, for example, to just have a, a much broader area to, to drive um, effective and successful campaigns on. So, um, why are we so passionate about listing optimization um, in the first place? Um, I would say it's pretty simple. Like we love cash, you know, he loves cash, and we assume that you love cash. And it's really as simple as that. Um, if we look into the numbers, and this is kind of from one of the, the case studies with a brand uh, that's doing right around uh, 900K per month in, in sales. Um, the effect of listing optimization can be seen in three specific areas. First of all, um, you drive more organic traffic. So you have more organic page views. Now, you also increase the quality of the listing. So higher conversion rates uh, on the entirety of your organic traffic um, that you have. And by the way, you also benefit from that higher conversion rate now on your advertised traffic because it it starts converting higher, starts delivering uh, better ad metrics. And um, basically for these guys here, 
Uh, we managed to increase profits by 21%. Um, also, obviously, a strong effect here is that since the majority of this lift is fully organic, um, you, know, you just have a ver hopefully a very healthy margin profile on that, which um, can significantly bump on profits here. And yeah, you know, this was just a monthly view. Like the way we see listing optimization is you get into new keyword markets, you rank within them, and you establish that as something that continues on and on. And that continuity for us is really key to things. Um, you, know, you may hear a little bit of my German accent, like he this guy has more of an Austrian accent in, in that sense. But um one of the things that you know he did extremely well was managing continuity, hustling every day and like building out the, that muscle and listing optimization, you know, can be treated in a similar way. It's like going to the gym, you know, once feels good, but it's really the routine that builds the muscle. Now you don't need to optimize your listings every day. That would probably be a little bit of an overkill, but we think, um, and we see in the data that optimizing a listing once a month uh, gives you um, good entrance, good exposure to keywords, but also gives you that little bit of a almost like honeymoon moment, like with that optimization. So you can keep growing and growing and growing in terms of exposure on that listing. Uh, so let's dive into like the, the specific tactics behind uh, the optimization. It's really about two things, discoverability and conversion. So let's start around discoverability. Um, Keywords are still driving um, a very important aspect of, of that. Like, yes, search is evolving, it's changing, but keywords are still uh, the name of the game when it comes to being placed, being found, um, and being purchased on, on Amazon. Um, context is getting more important. We're going to dive into a specific example around that in a second. And then, obviously, once you are discovered, the next thing is um, around conversion. So you know, what, how is readability of, of the listing of the content there? Are you speaking the customer voice? Do you have compelling images? Um, and then outside of those things, which I would say are, um, you know, keywords, context, conversion are all, are all things that you can do directly for your listing. You have the advertising side available to just generally push on, on brand visibility. Um, so back to the organic side, it's all about starting this flywheel. Now, this part here is kind of the organic flywheel, which means more organic traffic, hopefully better conversion rate, gets you more sales, which drives reviews and drives sales rank. And better sales rank then again, helps you drive more, more traffic. Now, we wanna unleash this flywheel in as many keyword markets as possible. Different keywords will have different conversion rates, but you want broad exposure across those keywords. And then obviously um, what matters is that this generates an ongoing lift. We see that this pattern of ongoing optimization uh, generates on average a 20% lift um, on the long tail, sometimes even, um, even a lot higher. Um, and then obviously into that flywheel, you can add um, paid traffic in, into the mix and with, with paid traffic, like further accelerate your sales. Um, when it comes to optimization, we think of sources and targets. Sources are where's the keyword knowledge coming from? Your PPC campaigns are a great source of that uh, information. PPC recommendations that Amazon provides, search query performance data. It's a little bit um, kind of fin finicky to get, but very important information. And then obviously you can use tools like Helium 10, Jungle Scout, uh, Data Dive to do a competitor research and learn additional things on the keywords. Then your targets, like where is this information actually going? Title, bullets, massive impact, search terms, very strong impact as well. Description, traditionally a little bit disregarded now, but getting a revival. Um, and then you have the A plus content like FAQs, uh, image alt text. And obviously you can use that keyword knowledge for the, the PPC side as well. Here's an example from just back in search term optimization. Uh, this was in the Italian marketplace, 3000 ASINs uh, that didn't have any search terms. And uh, we put in search terms, 500 characters, and you know, within the time frame here of the last two and a half months, started seeing 
an organic page uh, lift increase of 13% just um, search terms itself and ad clicks actually were pulled back. Now we compare that against the control group. The control group here um, around 6,000 ASINs um, was relatively moving flat, 1% increase, same ad pullback. Um, so it's one out of many examples where we see this play out. Now, Rufus is starting to change the game. It's not only about search terms anymore, not only about keywords, it's also getting context back in. And um, this example here posted by Destiny Wishin from BDR Media a couple of uh, uh, days ago, like shows that it's how, how Rufus is referencing this description. And uh, we think they're getting a big uh, revival in Second Life um, in terms of importance for, for setters. And then obviously around conversion, not everyone is L'Oreal and can, can get away with such a poor listing uh, like this one. Um, you wanna have your characters on you know, for bullet points around 200 to 250, um, not too many as well. Optimize the title for mobile. Uh, you wanna make sure your brand's spelled right and just consistency across variations. And it's, it's not simple. Um, with that, you can drive organic sales, you can drive ad efficiency, and really boost um, the advertising sales of the, sales of uh, side of things, um, because we really see listings and ad optimization kind of go in that that kind of yin yang relationship um, where both sides can help each other. And quickly, just to uh, wrap up, you know, is it a human? Is it a machine that is optimizing? Um, let's look at the numbers. If if you have you know, 100 products, 10 colors, 10 sizes, you're going into five marketplaces, you're tracking at least uh, half a million keywords across those listings. Those are 50,000 listings for you to, to optimize. And you know, let's say you spend 60 minutes researching, writing, updating content, performance controlling after that. Um, you know, that's about 3 million minutes every month uh, spent optimizing or in whatever time frame. Um, now, that's pretty damn hard. So we think it's really about collaborating um, and collaboration between human and the machine. We built a process where um, the machines are doing what they're good at. They're tracking keywords, they're enforcing style guides, they're enforcing Amazon terms of service and are delivering outputs, which are then quality controlled um, to make sure that there's no weird AI hallucination coming into this and really folks can kind of drive and benefit at scale. And it's basically as simple as enrolling ASINs. It's, you know, just like with Katita, you kind of set and forget to a certain extent, uh, it just prints money from when they're enrolled. We see that the same outcomes with us. And um, you know, in addition, you also get nice keywords for the PPC um, side of the house. Um, if you want to try it out risk-free with a money-back guarantee, shoot me an email, mention today's webinar, and i um, happy to dive into any questions. Perfect, perfect. I agree with everything that you said. Uh, we've helped a bunch of setters optimize their listings to a lot of people don't know this because we're a software company, but we've done it too. And the performance difference you got when you go from one of these listings where it's just like a couple images of the product at different angles with a white background, very like bare, short you know badly written bullet points nothing for the a plus to a fully optimized this thing is huge and uh, the sales lift is huge the improvement in organic is huge the improvement in even the ads is huge like with the conversion rate and everything so it's definitely something people need to pay attention to especially since most people don't hire people in-house or work with a full service agency to actually get this done and also your point about selecting the right products is also very significant. A lot of people are more fussed about their tiny products that are running at an ACOS that's too high or aren't selling. Whereas in reality, they should be focused on what's actually running their business and what's bringing money in. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, right now we have a Q&A session. You guys can send over some uh, questions to me in the chat and I'll read them out. I right, just give this a minute. Just get a couple of questions in. Right. So the uh, first question over here is for me. And it says, should people use a PPC software or an agency? And the answer to this is 
pretty nuanced. Um, usually it's both. Um, as you guys have noticed in this webinar, there's more to PPC than just the bids, the keywords, the harvesting, the negation, and the day parting. Some of it is like, hey, which products do I even advertise? Do these metrics make sense? Right, like if you're advertising a supplement using a PPC software and you have no clue what your lifetime value is, you know what you should be paying uh, in terms of customer acquisition cost. What's good? What's not good? How much money you're making in the long run? Like all of that won't matter if you don't know these numbers or if you don't have someone to manage this for you. So choosing which products to advertise, choosing how to budget for things, choosing what the A cost target is, what the tech cost target is, and all of that stuff still requires a human. Uh, the thing is though that most PPC sorry, agencies, most PPC agencies do use a software tool. So generally if you are going through an agency, you are also using software one way or another. So I'd recommend either if you're good at PPC yourself and you have the time, use a software and figure this stuff out on your own or hire someone in-house or do it through an agency. But you do need to have someone who knows what they're doing and someone who does actually think out the strategy of the business and how to close the account. PPC software is a tool for both and a tool for maintenance and efficiency, but it doesn't replace your role or the role of whoever's in charge of your Amazon sales uh, in terms of strategy or actually thinking things through. So that's my answer to that question. Uh, after that, we have some questions for Rael. Uh, first one is, can you share some category benchmark data in terms of retention rates and uh, lifetime value growth over time? And what should people be aiming for? Yeah, this is uh, <clears throat> something we get asked, I guess, quite a lot here. We're like, I've seen loads and loads of data for all the categories, right? So it's all very well saying, you know, my lifetime value is growing this much or my retention rate is 20%. Like, is that good? Or is that bad, right? <laughs> That's really the, the, the real question there. So, um, I mean, we would say like, I guess tier one categories would be things like supplements and pet food. Those are the ones that typically would have the largest lifetime value growth over time and the highest retention rates. Obviously those things are related. So specifically, like I would say uh, you're aiming from the first to the second order, you're aiming for at least 30%, ideally something like 35% of people coming back and placing uh, a second order. Now, we've also found that it's not good comparing this to D2C, right? Because fundamentally you don't have the same tools on Amazon as you do on, on D2C uh to influence repeat orders right you don't you don't have email marketing there is no clavio you don't have text messages you don't have abandoned cart reminders like all those tools aren't there so you can't expect the same retention rates uh but i would say like yeah tier, tier one 30 to 35 for like pet, uh, supplements and pet products below that i would say it's like food and drink health and beauty closer to 25 to 30 percent from the first to the second order um those would be some benchmarks there in terms of like what you're looking for for lifetime value growth um, we would say that I'd say good would look like 25% increase in LTV per purchase cycle or replenishment cycle. So if you know that like 80, 90% of your customers will place an order every three months, right? Like that's the expected replenishment cycle over a three month period, I would look for a 25% increase in LTV. Uh, if you're doing that, you're doing really, really well. Um, and you've got a lot of room to play with in terms of like, a much higher customer acquisition cost to go after, you know, payback period, all those things we spoke about earlier. So those would be like the four top categories. So just to recap, tier one on the pets and, and supplements, 30 to 35 percent, first to second order retention. Then health and beauty, I would say, is closer to like 25, maybe 30 percent for some premium beauty I've seen. Uh, and food and drink would be there as well. Um, I mean, interestingly, I've seen things like clothing, right, where retention is much, much lower. It's like 12 percent or something like that. But because the AOVs are so, so or like premium clothing, I said, the AOVs are pretty high. The margins can be pretty high. Even something like a 12% retention uh, could be pretty meaningful in terms of like driving overall profits there. So, you know, it's obviously related to, um, you know, to, to to like profits and um, and like AOVs too. But like, yeah, those are some benchmarks. Perfect. The second question, which is almost a follow-up to what you just mentioned, is what are some ways we can increase LTV? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the main lever, as I was saying, like the main levers you have, um, a lot of them don't apply on Amazon if you're used to the D2C world. But effectively, what drives lifetime value growth? It's going to be a combination of these three things. It's going to be a combination of, uh, number one, how many people come back? Not surprising, right? Customer retention, <laughs> turns out, is, a, is important. 
Uh, number two is going to be the timeline in which they come back. It matters whether they come back every year or every 90 days. The third thing that matters and the hardest to influence, at least in, in today's environment, is the profit margin. Because, you know, we're talking about profit per customer here. You can have somebody buying from you literally every single day. But if your margin is near zero, that lifetime value is not going to grow. So it's a combination of those three things. On Amazon, it's probably the easiest to influence like retention rates, right? How do I get more people coming back? Um, and that could be a combination of um, obviously subscribe and save would be the natural thing. Like the Holy Grail is people just sort of do this organically and they subscribe and save. And obviously you're not paying for any of those second, third, fourth orders, you know, via ads. Uh, but really the more sort of proactive things that you can do um, are things around remarketing and coupons. And, you know, DSP has got pretty granular targeting these days to only focus on uh, targeting people who've previously bought from you, trying to reactivate people who bought it a long time, but, but a long time ago, but haven't bought again. And you can offer discounts to people um, who've previously bought with you. So like those are the main mechanisms to focus on retention. Um, there are some things you can try to do about cross-selling and upselling to reduce that purchase cycle, right? If, if it's six months and you want to get it down to like three months where people are buying, well, think about cross-selling and upselling as well uh, to do that. So those are kind of the main levers there. Perfect. Andrew, someone's asking you if you use the same strategy for all products or if you have different strategies for each product. Um, great question. And um, I I can have different, I have a lot of strategies for products that are the same across different brands, across different categories. Um, I think there's a number of different strategies that you apply based on um, what you're selling. So I guess what I'm saying is like some strategies can apply to multiple products and some need to be unique to each one. Um, like they were talking about earlier, um, customer lifetime value. Like for example, I was showing um, a, a pet supplement brand and that strategy, uh, my tacos, uh, my A cost can be a lot higher. Our play there is subscribe and save because I know I have a 40% customer retention rate. I'm spending a lot to go get those customers. Um, when I'm just looking at one single month, it's not going to reflect that well. When, but if I'm looking at a trend of months over time, I'm seeing that those product subscribe and save numbers are going up. My customer retention is going up. I'm okay with those numbers and that strategy. So it kind of just really depends. Um, you know, does your product have organic ranking? Does it not? If you're just launching, you know, tacos numbers need to be different than others. Um, I think it really is about that. That's kind of the benefit of being an agency owner is that we get a lot of at bats, so to speak, you know, we worked with over 400 brands. I'm like, I kind of have a, almost like a gut instinct around this, this percentage seems off or this seems out of line, or this seems, you know, um, I don't know everything about your business, but maybe we should check here because I'm just like, you know, if our, if our cost of goods or promotional discounts or these things are too high before we even get to PPC or some of those other money spending things, the margin spending things, um, we're never going to be successful. So, um, long story short, different strategies for different products. Um, you know, it's not just a one, one half, one, one size fits all. Sure. That makes sense. Jim, someone's asking you what the main metrics and KPIs are to evaluate a reimbursements company and what makes Gatita the best. Um, okay. So what are you looking for? Well, I'll tell you what a lot of people look at is rates. Um, I think it's the wrong metric because what you should be looking at is there's two parts of this business. Number one is identifying the reimbursement opportunity. So let's assume that people do that. Okay. The second metric is success rates on cases open. And this is really important for two reasons. Number one, if you're spamming Amazon with low success rates, you put the account health at risk and extreme cases, you'll get suspended. You'll get put out of business. And we've seen that. Um, but success rates on cases open is really where your money's at because our job is to net maximum amount of money for the seller after fees and definitely more than if they were doing it themselves. And the metric that drives that is success rate on cases opened. So I think that's probably the most important one. It's not the fee. The fees are red herring. You can pay. It's like everything in life, right? You can, you can get some things really cheap and then you regret it afterwards. Um, so I would focus on success rates as, as probably the biggest KPI. That's good. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Perfect. Chris, um, people are asking how sellers could use AI to automate the process that you show this. Yep. Uh, so I think 
Um, on the AI side, there, there's a couple of things. First of all, um, Amazon it has started rolling out tools uh, for kind of greenfield listing optimization, which um, is a great place to start. Like, especially if you um, want to you know, have a solid listing as a, as a starting point um, that's available on the US marketplace was just rolled out to the, the European marketplace as well. And just helps kind of level the quality from uh, or come in with with a good quality. Um, the ongoing listing optimization is something that Amazon does not support, and that's really where, um, like, we think like our approach is really coming into play. Like that ongoing, um, you know, seeing like how is the market reacting to the product, how is the market changing, what keyword markets are <clears throat> opening up to kind of be sold into, and and feeding that in and. Um, at the end of the day, like for me personally, um, I rather focus on automation than on AI, um, and in terms of like value to, uh, to the seller and value to, to the brand. Um, because the most important thing is like what gets the job done at the end of the day. It's not, uh, you know, what gives you the, the nicest dashboards and, um, maybe the, the, the most metrics to, to look at. Um, because it's basically a cognitive overload and you know, folks just don't get the chance to even, even act on it. Um, and that's you know, obviously for, for our process, we apply AI in, in different forms, like with LMs around writing content or with the way we will look at keyword quality. Um, but I try to really see it in the context of automation, bring automation to the business, and this is you know, a no-brainer um, in our opinion because it makes money. It's proven that it creates that, that lift. And um, it's something that you know, most folks don't, just don't get to on, on a regular basis. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Perfect. We're right around time right now. So we're just going to wrap up here. Thank you for everyone who presented today. You guys did an amazing job. And thank you for those who joined us. The replay for this is going to be available on the AI Hello YouTube channel in case you guys want to watch it again. And yeah, that's it for this webinar. Thank you guys. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. See you. Thank, thank you. For having thank us. you. Thanks. Bye-bye.